All righty, it's one minute past um, 5 p.m. Stay tuned for Revolutions Per Minute coming up. Revolutions Per Minute is a weekly radio show from the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, recorded live at WBAI 99.5 in Brooklyn every Tuesday at 5. RPM is about doing the work, the work to build a democratic socialist future. Every week, hear the latest news, analysis, and organizing experience from the minds and hearts of activists fighting every day in NYC. Join the movement at socialists.nyc. Yo, it's Good New York. I'm Jack Devine. He, him pronouns, and you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute, back live on WBAI. We're a socialist radio show and podcast for members of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. The DSA is the largest socialist organization in the United States, with 56,000 members nationwide. And NYC DSA is its biggest chapter. We are run by our 5,500 plus members and organizers who are working together to build democratic socialism in all five boroughs. Before we begin, we want to shout out a new WBI buddy, Dave Solonio Volano, for showing love to Revolutions Per Minute and WBAI. We really appreciate your support. Revolution and counter-revolution are clashing against each other across the world. The contradictions are particularly exploding to the surface in Latin America, where millions of people are in the streets fighting to build working-class power in the face of imperialism and white supremacist terror. First, we'll speak with Robert Kavoris on the military coup in Bolivia against Evo Morales' democratically elected government and how socialist organizers are fighting back. Then we're joined by Antonio Atsuri from Democratic Revolution in Chile on the uprising there. But first, the headlines with Amy Wilson. Hey, what's up, New York City? This is Amy Wilson for Revolutions Per Minute with your headlines for today, November 19th, 2019. Members of the ongoing People's Movement in Lebanon celebrated on Tuesday another postponement of a planned parliament session. Peaceful demonstrators blockaded access to the parliament building in Beirut, confronting riot police who responded with violence. Among other demands, protesters are calling for an equitable response to government corruption and an end to austerity measures that have crippled access to jobs and public resources. Bolivia's new military dictatorship, headed by self-proclaimed President Janine Añez, has escalated violence against largely indigenous protesters demonstrating in support of former President Evo Morales, who was ousted last week by a right-wing coup. Añez issued a decree last Thursday protecting the military from prosecution for violent acts. On Friday, military forces shot to death nine people and injured dozens more at a peaceful protest of indigenous coca leaf growers and other Morales supporters. Protests are continuing throughout the country. Here in the United States, our own fascistic leader also emboldened military violence by issuing presidential pardons for three members of the armed forces accused or convicted of war crimes. This move came over the objections of U.S. military leaders. Among the pardoned men is Clint Lawrence, who was serving a 19-year prison sentence on a conviction of two counts of second-degree murder. Appearing on Fox News, he said, President Trump, I love you, sir. Activist Scott Warren of the humanitarian organization No More Deaths, No Mas Muertes will again face a federal trial after a deadlocked jury refused to return a verdict in his first trial this June. Warren, a geography teacher, is accused of two counts of harboring after he assisted migrants in the Arizona desert in 2018. For this second trial, Warren and his defense team have been forbidden from mentioning President Donald Trump, whose administration has targeted groups providing aid to migrants at the border. The prosecution has argued that any mention of the president or his administration would be irrelevant and that doing so would pose the danger of unfair prejudice. In Missouri, 
Hearings began Monday on a potential closure of the Central West End Health Center in St. Louis, the only legal abortion clinic in the state. State health officials accused the clinic of failing to meet safety standards. Planned Parenthood, the clinic's operator, has repeatedly rebutted these charges. Earlier this year, the state's Republican governor, Mike Parsons, signed one of the country's most restrictive abortion bills, outlawing any and all abortions on or past the eighth week of pregnancy, with no exception for rape or incest. The hearing is anticipated to last five days, with a ruling expected in the first months of next year. The closure of the Central West End Health Center would make Missouri the first state in the U.S. with no legal abortion providers operating within its borders. As temperatures drop in New York City, our neighbors in public housing are once again facing a lack of heat and hot water in their homes. Gothamist reports that nearly 23,000 tenants in NYCHA buildings across New York City experienced a heat or hot water outage at some point in the last week. A spokesperson for the Legal Aid Society says these outages underscore the need for increased public funding to more quickly upgrade and replace antiquated utility systems. This is a responsibility that Washington, Albany, and City Hall equally share. In these dark and cold times where reckless disregard for human life runs rampant, our socialist movement is advocating for the health and human rights of all people across borders, across gender, across the world, or across the street. Solidarity with all those who dedicate their lives to fighting for freedom and justice. I'm Amy Wilson for Revolutions Per Minute. Now back to this week's episode with Jack Devine. Thank you very much for that great reading of the headlines. Amy Wilson, our daily headlines are brought to you by The Thorn, an incredible weekly newsletter by NYCDSA Electoral Working Group, covering local politics and radical activism. Subscribe at thethorn.nyc. So we're trying to connect with um, Antonio Atria from Chile. So we just want to see if um, she is live on air. Can you hear us right now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, great. So we're going to actually uh, jump to the interview with you first, since that we have you now. So um, uh, before we get started on this specific situation, we just always like to, you know, uh, talk to our guests about what got them involved in the movement uh, for socialism and struggling against capitalism and what is democratic. Also, can you just explain a little bit what democratic revolution is in Chile? Um, Well, so Democratic Revolution is a party, um, part of the White Front, a coalition of different parties and movements. Um, The the reason we were born, so to speak, was during the 2011 student movement uh, protests, which were talking about free free education and quality education for all. then that movement sort of started getting institutionalized, which means we started fighting for places in Congress. And that was the start of the White Front, which made the accusation that we had um, two, part, two main conglomerates, a right-wing one and a left-wing one, one. But the left-wing conglomerate sort of had focused on administration of the neoliberal model for several years, for 30 years. And we were sort of done with that sort of politics that was not really pushing for a transformation and fighting for dignified living for everyone. And so that was the the birth of White Front or uh, Democratic Revolution. I think it's really crucial that you bring up uh, neoliberalism because especially the you know, the relationship between Chile and the emergence of this sort of neoliberal authoritarianism. So can you describe yeah. the crisis that uh, led to this uh, current working class uprising? How is it related to the legacy of the 1973 U.S.-backed coup against Salvador Allende? And why did it happen at this specific moment? Um, well, so the, the protests that we are living today are sort of the answer to a crisis of the neoliberal system here in Chile that I would argue has two main spheres or dimensions. On the one hand, there is the social crisis that is founded on Chile's economic inequality. And this 
shows basically in our privatized social security systems, our privatized health care systems, our educational system, and everything. That basically shows there's two different types of, of lives, the lives of the people who are rich and the lives of the working class that struggle month to month to make ends meet. Um, and so that was what started the revolution, the, the, the movement. Um, with the rise in the metro fair, which sort of showed you that the political, the powerful ones were not tired of abusing and abusing the working class to keep pushing reforms that made them struggle and struggle even more. And people were like, that's enough. And that sort of pushed a questioning of the entire economic system. But on the other hand, there's this political dimension to the problem, which was that during 30 years, we'd had swing parties or right-wing parties that were not able to push reforms in the, in the way of protecting people, meaning that they, um, well, they could not push reforms that made the social security system better or education system more equal and just. And so this is also an, uh, a, a movement that sort of answers to that situation. And how is this related to the coup and the military dictatorship? Is because we were the, exper- the last for a neoliberal experiment, I would argue. Um, during the dictatorship, the Chicago Boys, which were um, economists that studied under, under Milton Friedman, found here... Uh, a space with perfect control, controlled variables, you would say, to push their reforms and to push them into a, into a population that was dominated in every single aspect and could not really push back. And so that's how they pushed the reforms that led to our social security system nowadays. And they also pushed the Constitution, which is one of the big problems we which is a constitution that leaves the economic, the political powers completely dominated by the economic and factual powers, leaving them with little, little room to push real transformative reforms to change this model. In a way, the dictatorship um, tied every single aspect so that once they left power, their model could still work without them there. And with the several left governments not being able to do anything about it. I think you um, really describe the situation in a really crucial lens because I think when people think of neoliberalism, there's sort of like almost this embrace of what the ideologues are describing themselves, like this like free market society. But this free market society is built upon state violence. And Chile is the perfect example of that. But even in our own country, the expansion of the prison industrial complex, the war on drugs, the um, rising like immigration creation detention centers that these sort of economic policies are built on restricting democracy and throwing people in cages who are fighting against that so what so and and now this movement has emerged like who and you've been describing this already um but in a little more detail like who is the social base of the movement what are your short-term demands and your long-term political horizon well what this the social base of this movement is basically middle class and working class families. The movement started by high school and middle school students evading the, the subway, you would say, that is jumping the turnstiles of the subway. And the government's answer to that massive, massive evasion was saying, well, they are just criminals because the rise of the fair was not to the students, was to the general public fair. And that made families start coming out for their, protecting their children or arguing for them, saying, my kid is jumping the turnstiles because he, can, he or she can see that I cannot make ends meet, that I cannot buy bread for the family, that I cannot have a decent, give them a decent education because I don't have the economic means for this. And so that created uh, intergenerational, you would say, solidarity that pushed this social base. And the, it was the people, common people, going out to protest in the millions. 
and that's how it was. I would say that was how um, this social base was conformed. Um, and then that made the short-term demands pretty clear. The short-term demands are the ones that try to alleviate the burden of the family's pocket. That means rising the minimum wage um, to a dignified wage, um, rising the social security, the retirement pensions, I guess. You, I don't know how you say it in English, right? But oh, no, you got it right. But, <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, and the health care, because today we have people dying waiting to get treatment. So the short-term demands are sort of going to moving towards solving this structural problem at least to alleviate the burden that these families feel and then the long-term demand well because the right has always been very against changing anything of this neoliberal order of course um and so with the constitution they could do that for example when we tried to pass a law that made unions have the titularity i guess you would say to negotiate with their employers in strikes, they declared that unconstitutional. They said that other groups could also form to also negotiate, and that takes away power from the working class uh, when confronted with their employers. And so all of those little changes that we tried to make were declared un unconstitutional. That revealed that we have a political system that cannot answer and cannot protect citizens in front of the economic and factual powers. So our main problem is the Constitution, that what constitutes our political base, our, our political foundation, you would say. So today we're trying to move towards writing a new Constitution that stops the state or the political powers being dominated by the economic powers. You, you hit on uh, two things that I've been thinking about a lot recently. One is just like the how incredible and, and beautiful it is to see like a, over a million people out on the street of uh, Santiago and like singing yeah. songs that were um, made by artists who were murdered by the dictatorship and tortured by the dictatorship. So just seeing that yeah. and kind of building this culture around the movement and then also the – the innovative tactic of storming uh, the subway turnstiles. And I feel like what we've seen is that has kind of, uh, there's been like a transnational uh, tactical dialectic in the sense that here in New York, um, this past month, you had like uh, hundreds of organizers also storming the subway turnstiles. And so there's kind of like a relationship between the movement in Chile and the movements here in New York. So can you describe yeah. some of the other innovative tactics that have been utilized by organizers in the street? How is the government reacting? And how does your struggle relate to the broader wave of uprisings across the globe? Like, is this a potentially revolutionary moment? I think this is a potentially revolutionary moment, especially in Latin America, where we're seeing several um, sparks of movements like Colombia, Ecuador, and Argentina last year. Um so this is definitely moving towards that direction. However, the government here, and this is another of our key demands right now, has answered in a very repressive sort of way. Um, I don't know if you've seen the numbers, but we have over 2,000 people hurt. We have over 200 people with mutilations or partial losses of their eyes because police here are firing rubber bullets, which actually we have found out recently are only composed 20% rubber, 80% other metals. So they have been really damaging people who are that are um, protesting specifically. And we have over 200 people that have been shot in the face and thus losing their eyes or partial loss of their sight. So that has been very um, a, a big problem here that we're trying to make um, a lot of noise and a lot of international pressure to not have impunity, which has been a problem here since the dictatorship, to try to make the responsibles of this, the government, responsible. Um, and I would say that the not innovative ways of protest have been precisely, well, the, the jumping of the turnstiles, but also a very localized um, discussion, discussion group. That means in every territory, we get together around 30 to 80 people, that's the range, to discuss what is going on and what ways we can mobilize in our, in our 
local sp- space, as you would say. Um, and that has been really new. That has not happened in Chile since, well, since I'm alive, at least. <laughs> so that has been um, the, the rebuilding of social um, networks, I guess you'd say. The rearticulation of neighborhoods has been something that the neoliberal system destroyed and that has been forming again. So, like the development of like um, networks of like working class solidarity institutions rooted in the community that are fighting back. Exactly, exactly, and a lot of well, we call it juntas de vecino, which are um, groups of neighbors that get together, and those have actually had a key role in explaining the people um, everything about the constitution, which is a very boring um, and sort of. Um, dry discussion, you would say, um, and to make it an everyday problem. And the other thing that's happened is that um, the people who cover their faces, we call them capuchas, were really seen negatively before this because um, they tend to make barricades or things like that, and people did not really support it. But today, with the level of repression and violence we're receiving from the police, um, they have sort of changed their character and now people support them because these capuchas protect the manifestation the demonstration they get around the manif- the protest and sort of fight with cops while everyone else is trying to um, make their point and that sort of solidarity in w- within the movement is also something new innovative that i would say is worth seeing well, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and giving us an update on the situation down in Chile. I think it's something that socialists here in the United States absolutely need to pay attention to and stand in solidarity with the movement. I absolutely stand in solidarity with the movement. And uh, just um, just thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see some also more cool laser pointer videos that are uh, disrupting the police. <laughs> Yeah, no, and thank you so much for giving us these platforms to sort of tell our story and get the the message across. Of of course, that's um, our mission here at Revolutions Per Minute and uh, the mission here at WBAI. So thank you so much um, for joining us, and we hope to hear from you soon and that um, the working class continues to build power and hopefully um, really disrupt this neoliberal regime and build true democracy in Chile. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So I just want to remind our listeners that you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com or sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. You can also find us on Twitter at NYCRPM. Today, we're talking about the struggles in Latin America and how critical they are. And I think the fact that we were just able to have that interview and hear the perspective of someone who's struggling against you know, neoliberalism, austerity, capital, and empire is really what's so special about um, the radio station like WBAI. You won't hear this on MSNBC, CNN, of course not, uh, like fascist propaganda on Fox News. Um, you won't really hear this sort of perspective on NPR. They're going to kind of hesitate to ever really uh, normally stand in solidarity and show the perspective of um, organizers working on the ground fighting against the same really interests that fund their station. And WBAI is funded by its listeners. So if you want more content like this, if you want a media that really fights for the working class and shares perspectives on how empire is destroying people's lives around the globe, go to give to WBAI.org. That's give number two, WBAI.org. And, you know, Pledge your support for the station. Say that, you know, maybe Revolutions Per Minute is your favorite show. Become a buddy. 
you know, show your support. We would really love um, to get that sort of support from you. Uh, so now we're going to transition. Um, we talked about the situation in Bolivia last week, but things are constantly on the move. The kind of dialectic between revolution and counter-revolution, the coup and the movements that's emerging against it, the tensions are really heightening. So we were joined, um, I was joined by Robert um, Kavoris, a DSA member who recently just finished his dissertation at UC Santa Cruz on the increasingly intense class war being waged in Bolivia. Here's that interview we'll right now. What's good, everybody? This is Jack Devine with Revolutions Per Minute, and we've got a special recorded interview for you today. Uh, I'm here with um, Robert Kavoris, an author and editor at the Viewpoint Editorial Collective, and someone who recently uh, finished his dissertation um, in the History of Consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He is also a DSA member who has been involved in labor um, organizing um, migrant rights and uh, also fighting for um, tenant rights. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so we, we're just going to dive in straight to the topic. We uh, discussed this last week on the episode, but we were kind of hoping to get further into it this week, uh, the situation in Bolivia, which is moving. There was the military coup last Sunday, but the people are organizing and fighting back. But we want to dive a little bit into the history. So, Robert, how did the movement for socialism emerge in Bolivia as a transformative force, and who is its primary social base? The movement towards socialism, or the MAS, as it's generally called, um, basically emerged in the 1990s uh, in Bolivia, and in particular in a region called the Chapare region. And uh, it was first conceived of as a, in, in the terms of the people who created it, a political instrument um, for some of the social movements there. And in particular, it was the political instrument of the coca growers union. So Eva Morales was a uh, coca farmer and uh, organizer in their union. And at a certain point, these unions decided that they wanted to run candidates in local elections, um, but they realized to do that, they'd have to register as a party. And at this time, in the 90s, there were kind of like a whole host of basically neoliberal parties who were very difficult to distinguish from one another. Um, they all pretty much held the same, the same policy positions. Uh, and so the idea of being a party in sort of that sense didn't appeal to everyone, but the idea that they could start an organization that would be more like a, an instrument, a, a functional tool for competing politically was uh, more appealing. So the MAS came out of that. And, and in particular, the coca growers in this region at the time were fighting against DEA sponsored crop eradication efforts um, that the, the Bolivian government at the time was collaborating with. Um, and so this was their kind of major issue. That was the sort of initial starting point for the MAS. Uh, between 2000 and 2005 in Bolivia, there was a kind of mass set of political uprisings um, from a lot of sectors, but mainly led by uh, different, different groups of people who you could term indigenous in Bolivia. And this term has a kind of complicated history in Bolivia. Um, but... The, the Aymara coca growers was one group. There's also other kind of indigenous groups in the eastern lowlands portion of the country. Uh, and then there's other Haim uh, Aymara and Quechua speaking groups in the kind of um, Andean half of the country. Uh, and so there were a whole bunch of kind of uh, anti-neoliberal movements at this time. And in 2002, the MAS, or by 2002, the MAS had kind of expanded its reach and had been in touch with a lot of these movements. So it was no longer just representative of the coca growers in Chapare, but a number of the, the insurgent indigenous groups that were participating in politics at the time. Abel Morales ran for president in 2002. He didn't win, but he very surprisingly, uh, he had a surprisingly good showing um, against all of the traditional neoliberal parties. Then... By 2005, there was a kind of real attempt by the MAS to, to get these movements to coalesce around him. Um, 
in 2003, there was one president was deposed by protest in 2005, another. Then in 2005, you had the election in which Evo finally won. Um, so the MAS's base is, is traditionally the indigenous sectors of the country, it's tr- which is the majority of the country, uh, and it's traditionally the people who were most negatively affected by the kind of neoliberal policies of the 80s and 90s and who went on to reject it in that period. And it seems that also because the these uh, you know the DEA being involved that it it really emerged as a immediately anti imperialist movement as well would that be a correct assessment? Yeah, that's right. I mean the the DEA was definitely a key factor in its creation um, for those cocoa growers, uh, and then furthermore in that kind of two thousand to two thousand five period. Um, a lot of the struggles were, were definitely anti-imperialist. So the, the kind of famed water war of Cochabamba where um, the government had decreed, and basically they were privatizing the city's water system. Um, and so this meant everything from increasing rates in terms of what people were going to pay for water to actually making it illegal for, uh, for instance, farmers and campesinos to build wells uh, to collect rainwater. I mean, this was kind of like the most egregious uh, privatization you could imagine that if you collect rainwater, that's a, that's a violation of the contract with this private company, which was a transnational company uh, basically owned by Bechtel, among some others, which is itself a bigger transnational company. Um, and so there was a big rejection of this idea that transnational companies could privatize Bolivian natural resources. Uh, the same was true in 2003 and 2005, those kinds of peaks of struggle. Um, there it was about privatizing natural gas, which is uh, Bolivia's main export and a huge portion of their economy. Um, it had already been largely privatized in the 80s and 90s by previous neoliberal laws, but in 2003 and 2005, you had uh, proposals to build new pipelines that would help new companies kind of come in and export it with very little of the money going back to the Bolivian state. Uh, so again, there was a big rejection of those on the part of um, popular classes. And this wasn't a, an anti-imperialist rejection. It was a rejection of the idea that, again, a transnational company could come in and benefit from Bolivia's natural resources without any of those benefits going to the people. So Evo Morales and the the movement for socialism um, come into power after, as you just explained, both like decades of uh, neoliberal policies and in the midst these struggles against uh, an intensification of privatization and extraction of resources. So how do these struggles inform their theory of change and eventually their political practice while in power? And what did... Um, they do for the working people of Bolivia when they were in power? How did they improve their material conditions? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that for the first few years, well, okay, one important thing to note is that upon uh, being elected in 2005 and taking office in 2006, um, the MAS was intent on following through with a promise and one of the protest demands from that period, which was for a constituent assembly. Um, so basically one important thing was rewriting the constitution, right? This was the, the constitution that was rewritten from 2006 to 2009, ratified in 2009. Uh, it essentially refounded Bolivia as a plurinational state, uh, meaning a state in which many nations were present. And this is a reference obviously to the kind of many indigenous groups there, um, as opposed to a national republic. Um, so that kind of set the stage, and that gives you a sense, I think, of of what kinds of things they were looking to do, and that there was a certain amount of um, ambition to really make some serious changes. At the same time, in you know, the mosque started out as this kind of political instrument of social movement. It also, more and more, I would say, took on the character of a traditional party, not in terms of sharing all of the kind of neoliberal policies of the traditional parties, but formally 
uh, became less directly controlled by the social movements as it grew, got more electorally focused, I would say. Um, but it still definitely tried to maintain a relay with a lot of those movements. Uh, so, for instance, while at the beginning of the MAS's existence, it was actually run by a council of movements, um, later on the council of movements was subordinated to a kind of political directorate, uh, even though this political director, including Evo and all the ministers and everyone like that, um, they did have regular kind of advisory meetings with the social movement. So there's some novelty there. The Constitution, uh, this isn't so much about the mosque, but about the political model they were pushing. Um, the Constitution did allow for a great deal of autonomy uh, at different levels for different groups of people in Bolivia. So from um, small indigenous communities that wanted to establish their autonomy, there was a way to do that in the Constitution. Regionally, there was more autonomy in some ways than there had been before. Um, and so there was a, a somewhat decentralized character to politics in Bolivia that also led to a decentralized character to the mosque and more local control, um, which, you know, had sometimes contradictory effects. Local politicians who once opposed the mosque then sometimes wanted to join the mosque because they saw it as an avenue for advancement, things like that. Um, so I think this was, this was something that was always a little bit in flux and always a little bit contested among different forces in the mosque over the years. Um, but it is definitely important still consistently the mosque was more responsive to popular protests, to social movement actors than any government that came before it. And certainly will be more, was more responsive to those groups than, uh, already the, the new supposedly transitional government will be as well following the coup. Um, as far as the other portion of your question, what did the MAS actually achieve? Um, I mean, the, the social conditions and the conditions of social welfare under the MAS uh, improved dramatically over the last 15 years. Um, in 2002, for instance, you had 75% of the rural population living in poverty. Uh, under Morales, poverty declined from 60% of the overall population to 38% in 2016. And extreme poverty fell even more than that by about half from 38% to 16% during that period. Um, you also had, like I mentioned before, and the way that these things were able to be achieved, uh, the mosque completely renegotiated the terms on which foreign companies could exploit Bolivian resources. Um, and this was one of the first things they did in office was basically uh, say to all these transnational companies, if you want to extract gas or other resources from Bolivia, um, you're not going to do it at a profit to yourself and at a loss to the Bolivian state and the Bolivian people. So before the mosque in power, you basically had companies where they would pay 15%, a 15 tax, uh, basically, on all of the profits they made when they sold Bolivian gas. Um, under the renegotiated contracts, starting in about 2006, you then had the Bolivian state getting 80% of the profits and the companies only getting 20%. So it's a complete reversal of who benefits from that. And with that money, they were able to pay for programs that reduce poverty, programs that improved access to education, uh, improved access to health care, and generally uh, managed to get money into the hands of people who really didn't have access to it, um, mostly the, the indigenous people of Bolivia during this period. And I want to thank Robert Cavoris very much for joining us. He actually sat down for another couple questions, and we'll share the rest of that interview um, on a Revolutions Per Minute podcast stream. So I just want to remind everybody that you are listening to Revolutions Per Minute on listener-sponsored WBAI in New York City, broadcasting at 99.5 FM and streaming on your favorite podcast app. To connect with us after the show, you can email us at revolutionsnyc at gmail.com or sign up for our newsletter to get links to what we talk about on the show. You can do that on our website, revolutionsperminute.simplecast.com. You can also find us on Twitter, at NYCRPM. Today, we have been discussing the working class uprising in Chile. Um, we heard directly from an organizer down there, and then we just spoke with Robert Kavoris on the coup in Bolivia. And uh, you can check out more of that interview on our podcast stream um, later today. 
Um, so before we uh, dive into the listener phone calls, and we've got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left in the show, and please call in at 212-209-2877. Again, that's 212-209-2877. I just want to remind our listeners how important uh, WBAI is as a working class institution that shares perspectives that you will never hear on corporate media. And so it's really, really important for people, if they have the resources, to become a either a WBI buddy, and you can do that and show your you know, appreciation for what we're doing out here on Revolutions Per Minute by going to give to WBAI.org. That's give, the number two, WBAI.org. Or if you want to, you know, call it and, um, and just show your uh, appreciation and solidarity. Go to the website. Make a big donation if you have the resources. It's really important in these you know, in this time of this global uprising, but also this threat of global fascism, that we have media institutions that are willing to take a stand and talk about the really, you know, significant issues that are out here in this country rather than just, you know, exclusively covering horse race politics. Um, so we've got a special caller in um, live on WBAI. Anne is here to uh, tell us a little bit about a reproductive um, justice um, day school, uh, if that's correct. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Socialist Feminist Working Group is hosting a reproductive justice activist day school this Saturday, November 23rd, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at Verso Books. Um, so we have four different panels happening um, we have a panel on the past, present, and future of reproductive justice, and we have T.C. Bhattacharya and Jenny Brown and Marion Jones from DSA speaking on that panel. Um, we have another panel on women's strikes and reproductive justice in the workplace. Um, we have a panel on Medicare for All and reproductive justice, and then we have a panel on confronting the rights and the tactic of clinic defense. Um, and that panel is going to feature Liz Winstead, who is a co-founder of The Daily Show and who's the founder of a group called Abortion Access Front. Um, so we have a ton of really great speakers. We're also going to have a socialist bake-off. Um, and the winner of that is going to win a free copy of Jenny Brown's new book, Without Apology. So um, we have a couple of um, feminist uh, groups who are co-sponsoring it, too. So um, we have Feminist Press, Jacobin. Uh, Red Bloom, Abortion Access Front, National Women's uh, Liberation, uh, International Women's Strike, NYC, and uh, the DSA Medicare for All Working Group, too. Um, that seems like a really um, great event. And uh, before you jump off, you want to just uh, kind of give the reason why um, people, organizers, felt this was such an important political education um, event to hold why it's needed in DSA, and uh, just repeat for our listeners um, where it is and when they can go. Sure. Um, so the Social Feminist Working Group decided to put this together because we felt that um, a lot of our movements weren't speaking to each other. Um, we kind of saw that there were these kind of movements that were a little bit siloed. So there's a movement for kind of feminist issues in labor organizing, for Medicare for all, for abortion access. We're all being kind of done by different groups of activists and we weren't actually getting a chance to talk to each other or to share strategy with each other. Um, so we put this uh, day of uh, political education together mostly as a way for activists to connect with each other and for us to make sure that we're that our movements are sharing strategy ideas and that we're kind of all working together you know to kind of uh, advance our collective struggle. Um, so hopefully this will give um, activists a chance who are kind of you know, really uh, interested in working in all of these issues, a chance to connect with each other and to uh, discuss how our strategy for winning one issue is actually going to be a strategy for winning, uh, you know, kind of all of these struggles. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to make it uh, clear that, the, you know, kind of the abortion access campaign that Sochfem has recently put together um, obviously is very uh, intent on working towards um, free abortion on demand, but that that's not the only thing that we're working towards. So there are all these other feminist issues uh, that fall under the category of reproductive justice. Um, so including things like safe working conditions and paid parental leave um, and free health care and all of these things are 
uh, reproductive justice issues that uh, that this campaign is really um, active in. Uh, and the, the day school is going to be on Saturday, uh, November 23rd, this Saturday from 10 to 6 at Verso Books, um, which is at 20 J Street, Suite 1010. Um, we're going to have coffee and bagels in the morning, and we're serving lunch, and then we'll have drinks at the end. Well, thank you so much for calling in and letting our listeners know about this really, I think, important event, this um, great way to really connect theory and practice that's happening and all the organizing that's happening here in New York City. Um, so thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, we've got a, we've got a couple minutes uh, to take uh, maybe one or two calls. Uh, you can call in at 212-209-2877. Again, that's 212-209-2877. Seven seven. Um, I just uh, want to reiterate something. I think uh, the past week has really revealed the distinctions between um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and people have been discussing Medicare for all, and I think that's a really critical lens to look at it. But I think more broadly in terms of imperialism, and it's not that you know Bernie has always had the perfect stance or is always on the right side of these issues. He is a United States senator. Uh, so he has not always shown um, solidarity with uh, movements of the left, but he normally does. And he was a fighter for this back in the 80s against um, you know, the Contras. He stood in solidarity with Central American leftists then, and he's doing it now with um, demonstrating his solidarity with Evo Morales, with the movement for socialism in Bolivia against this fascist coup. While Elizabeth Warren is much more teetering around, she doesn't really make any clear statements about it, that she wants this process to be right, but she's not condemning the actions of this fascist takeover. So I think, you know, when you go, uh, if you decide to donate to someone, if you decide who you're voting for in the upcoming primaries, and you care about the issues of imperialism, you value the lives of people who don't live in the United States, really take that into consideration when you who for whoever you vote for. Um, so before we go, I, I just want to, you know, share with our listeners, a preview clip of something that we'll be discussing uh, next week. Uh, Lee Zishi, um, one of our hosts, was um, up in upstate New York at the Cricket Valley shutdown, where there was some really impressive organizing going um, against the fossil fuel industry. So we're going to roll that now. Um, uh, check it out, and we'll be back for a brief goodbye. In the early morning hours before the sun was rising, New Yorkers pulled a tractor into the entrance of the Cricket Valley Frack Gas Power Plant, currently under construction, preventing the day shift from entering the site. The massive 1,100 megawatt plant, located in Dutchess County, New York, is completed and allowed to go into operation. It will be one of the largest frac gas power plants in the Northeast and one of the largest sources of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. As soon as the tractor was in place, 10 people locked themselves to it and another group began spreading out, holding a banner that looked like the rays of the sun, forming a soft blockade in front of the tractor. Get up! Get down! Eat fossil fuels in the ground! Get up! Get down! Eat fossil fuels in the ground! An hour earlier, four people had entered the site and begun climbing one of the 28-story, 275-foot tall smokestacks of the plant. Here's Ben Schwartz, a local farmer in one of the smokestack four, in a video captured at the top of the stack by fellow climber Monica Hunkin. Uh, we're here shutting down Cricket Valley Energy Center. It's a, it's a power plant based off of fracked gas here in um, the beautiful Harlem Valley. Um, as, you, as you can see, um, there's, an, there's a middle school and a high school right there, and we're on top of three highly 300 foot polluting smokestacks that, um, where the pollution is going to go straight into young developing minds and bodies. Totally unacceptable. There's also an elementary school right down this road 
And then behind us we have endangered habitat, the great swamp. We have tree frogs, bald eagles. This is a terrible place for a frack gas plant. Fracking is illegal in New York and there's no reason why this plant needs to exist. Now, we have shut down this plant for the day and this is a really important thing. This plant should be shut down permanently. And, but this is a start. Local residents are particularly concerned that the plant's location in the Harlem Valley, a narrow north-south corridor, will engulf the region with pollution. By 8 o'clock in the morning, construction of the plant had been shut down for the day and workers were sent home. The blockade on the ground allowed for them to leave the site and began singing, With you, for you, on your side. We are the rising tide as the workers filed out to show them they were fighting for a just transition to renewable energy that does not leave workers behind. The tractor blockade lasted seven hours before arrests were made by state troopers and people were charged with trespass. The smokestack climbers came down as the sun was setting after occupying the tower for 12 hours. They were arrested and charged with criminal trespass. In total, 29 people were arrested for shutting down the plant for the day. New Yorkers are now calling on Governor Andrew Cuomo to shut down the plant for good, a message the climber sent 275 feet up, looking down on the Harlem Valley. The smokestack force, eh? Governor Cuomo! Stop fracked gas! Shut down Cricket Valley! Now! On next week's episode of Revolutions Per Minute, we will have more on this dramatic shutdown of the Cricket Valley frack gas power plant as we cover the expansion of frack gas infrastructure in New York State, including a pipeline currently being built by National Grid in Bushwick. This is Lee Zishi reporting for RPM on WBAI. Back to you, Jack. Thank you, Lee, for that great on-the-ground report and a nice preview of what we're going to be discussing here next week. And uh, as always, solidarity with organizers and activists fighting back against fossil fuel capital. So this has been Revolutions Per Minute on WBAI 99.5 FM. Um, If we're uh, going to be back next week, as I just Uh, iterated uh, on that issue. So thank you very much for joining us, and um, we hope to uh, be in your ears next week at uh, 5 p.m. on Tuesday. Thank you.